So um, without further... This meeting is being recorded. Thank you, Ruth. Um, so hi again, folks. Uh, this meeting is uh, really a focus of what's happening at a granular level at the Senate Bill 1383 and how different jurisdictions are preparing to to um, to manage and, and be prepared to respond to that requirements, those requirements. Um, today is, is an interactive discussion between three jurisdictions. We have an urban uh, jurisdiction, that's the city of San Jose. Shakia Gupta is going to be presenting in behalf of the city. Um, there's a what I call a blended jurisdiction, so both a rural and an urban blend is Sacramento County. Tim Israel will be talking about the, how they're progressing. And then a rural jurisdiction, Butte County, Craig uh, Sissel is going to be talking about uh, how they're progressing along in that county. Um, uh, to ena enable the most amount of time, uh, we're going to go directly to uh, San Jose. Shakia is going to present on uh, on their progress thus state thus far. And again, um, save your questions or post them in the in the um, chat box so we can see what you're interested in. And we're going to hold questions until we've gone through the three uh, presentations. We'll stop then and um, pick up any questions and open up for open dialogue. So, are we ready to go? And Shaki, do you want to oh, uh, share your screen or should we have Ruth do that for us? I'll go ahead and do that, but just let me know, Tim, if I'm sharing the right screen. So give me one sec here. Okay. Yep, it's coming up. So do you see my notes or do you see um, the actual presentation? Uh, it looks like it's the presentation without notes. Okay, awesome. Uh, All right. Oh, no, no, no. I think it, the notes are showing up. I think you need to do the... Um... Oh, I don't see it. Okay. How about now? That's better. That's better. That's, That's it right there. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Um, thanks, Tim. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Shikha Gupta. I'm with City of San Jose Integrate Waste Management Program. Uh, I work with the division as a senior environmental program manager, and I oversee our business and civic services team. Um, I'm the lead on the implementation of SB 3083 um, in the city of San Jose. So been working on it, of course, as all of you probably are for now months, feels like years, <laughs> but um, uh, just wanted to walk you through what our city has been doing and our existing programs as well. So as San Jose, we, uh, and IWM, Integrated Waste Management, we provide solid waste collection, processing, and disposal services to the residents and businesses. We've been a leader in recycling since 1985. We were actually one of the first big cities in the US to offer curbside recyclables collection. We've won various awards over the years, um, you know, as a testament to our leadership in the field. Um, and we have adopted also climate emerg res uh, emergency resolution in 2019, which prioritizes efforts to become a zero waste city and a commitment to a cleaner and greener San Jose. And our division, uh, we oversee various contracts and agreements for the services we provide for by various haulers and facilities located in San Jose. So the residential and commercial programs are very distinct and operate very differently. So we'll walk through that in a minute here. We also oversee our construction and demolition waste stream um, through our non-exclusive haulers, facilities, and our deposit program. Our budget is about $130 million for, this, for all our systems. And our landfill diversion requirements surpass recycling mandates. We have about 70% diversion for residential and city facilities, 95% diversion for our residential yard trimmings and 60% for our commercial program. So just a brief history of San Jose's solid waste program um, is kind of on this slide. A couple of things uh, related to SP 383 and our organics diversion, I kind of wanted to point out on this is when we started doing um, or starting our residential garbage processing, the main intention was to uh, you know, uh, process the organics there in 2008. And then in 2012 is when we rehauled our commercial program and um, we, had a not, we now have the exclusive franchise commercial system with Republic Services as our um, franchise hauler. And then also the organics um, processing provided by Zero Waste Energy Development Company who have an anaerobic digestion facility in San Jose on Newbie Island. So that was um, our, basically the biggest thing 
um, that we have an AD facility in the city that we have been utilizing since 2012. So we have been ahead of the game a bit with that, uh, definitely with our organics programs. So even, you know, we are just so fortunate to have such a robust recycling infrastructure within and close to San Jose that basically helps us keep our carbon emissions low. And then, you know, we have base, we are unique that way and definitely we have maximized on this strength. So, um, you know, five major material recovery facilities that we have in, within our system, including our dry and aerobic digestion, like I mentioned earlier. So Republic Services uh, provides our commercial uh, service provider. They have a, material, a morph here on Newby Island. Then Zero Waste Energy Development Company, ZWED, is our commercial organics uh, provider. And they are a dry fermentation and aerobic digestion facility. It, uh, in, and it's the first large scale commercial dry fermentation AD facility in the, in the United States. It produces green renewable energy and also feedstock for composting. So it processes about 90,000 tons per year of organic waste, and it's able to produce um, power and materials that are directed to composting. Then we also have our green waste MARF um, that incorporates three different distinct processing facilities, uh, single stream recyclables, garbage and mixed materials, and yard trimmings. And ZVEST is a composting facility, which is in Gilroy, and it processes our yard trimmings into organic compost, and it recovers more than 85 to 90% of all the materials that they receive. And then we also have like Zanko recycling here for our CND processing. Um, California Waste Solutions MRF also processes, um, which is also in the city, has um, um, the recyclables collected uh, from our residential stream. Um, so basically city waste is processed through one of these facilities including all the organics collected through our residential and commercial streams. So they are basically a, the backbone of our system. Um, so just for, uh, focusing on the residential organics, the so city's residential solid waste program is robust, provides needed services to all our residents. It provides services to about 220,000 single family households and about 115,000 plus multifamily in 3,300 complexes. So the residential system has four service providers, um, Green Waste Recovery, California Waste Solutions, Green Team, and Garden City Sanitation. So our SFD is basically a three bin system, a black garbage bin, a gray recycle bin, and an optional green uh, yard trimmings bin. And we have a unique yard trimmings collection as loose in the street rather than in a bin. So all material collected is processed to extract recyclables and organics. And MFDs have a similar setup of bins and processing. So the residential provi uh, program provides year round, unlimited, also loose in the street yard trimming collection while some cities have seasonal. So we do do that all year long around. And then um, other main component of our system of the residential is that actually the garbage that we collect is sorted by Green Waste Recovery Murph to recover recyclables and organics. Um, so, and it, then it's composted from there. So we call it back-end processing or mixed waste processing. So all the material that we collect um, basically is processed by, at one facility or another. Um, and also we provide unlimited recycling collection, unlimited large item collection at no charge to our residents. And these are done by California Waste Solutions and Green Team. And of course, our programs are focused on education, ease of use, and low costs. We provide a wider range of unlimited services, which brings our uh, great value to our residents that way. So this schematic is basically focusing on our um, flow of residential organic material through our system. So yard trimmings are collected either on, loose, um, on the street or in bins. And it's, the material is, like I said earlier, uh, sorted at Green Waste Morph in, the, um, in, the li uh, in their yard trimmings line and then send over to ZBest uh, for composting. Um, so these, since these are clean yard trimmings, we receive about 97% diversion from the land for, for this, this material. The other streams of organic material collected in the residential stream is in the garbage in the black bins, um, and SFDs and green dumpsters in our MFDs. So the garbage collect contains all household organics along with other materials. So these are these are also taken to our green waste morph um, on municipal solid waste line to extract recyclables and organics. So organics are then sent to ZBest for composting and converted into compost. 
so we receive about 70% diversion on this material through that process. And then, um, you know, all our residue ends up in um, Newby Island landfill. Our commercial system is different. <laughs> it doesn't follow the same trail. So commercial collection system is set up different and the commercial collection processing is provided by Republic Services, who is our exclusive franchise hauler and organics are uh, processed at ZWED. Um, so the system is an innovative wet dry we started off as, where as the name indicates, all wet material goes into our wet green bin and all dry goes into the dry blue bin. So wet is organics and um, dry is everything else basically. And if a business generates a large amount of one of the dry materials, like a glass, cardboard, or plastic, they can get a customized bin also. So we are in the process of kind of figuring out how we all fit into this uh, new world of SP 3083, although our system kind of captures all the organics anyways. So uh, businesses right now have the option to select one of these three bins. So the, our system is basically a one plus bin system, and um, it's basically set up for ease of use. So we have about 8,000 accounts in that system. And uh, Republic does, uh, under their franchise agreement, they, does most of, they do most of the work. They provide um, you know, even customer service billing and education to, uh, to other businesses. So, uh, um, so all the material, like you can see on this uh, schematic here too, it is collected um, through Republic. And then um, the wet bins, uh, so the wet, the organics actually ends up uh, directly hauled to ZWED. So those routes directly go to the uh, facility and then they process it, of course, to um, you know, produce electricity and digestate, then that, that goes to ZBest for composting. And, Part of the agreement, uh, some dry material uh, also goes to ZWED and it goes through a similar process. So we achieve about 60% diversion from the landfill on this uh, stream. And then residue, of course, goes to New uh, Newby Island landfill. And um, uh, both these facilities and the commercial system are commingled facilities. So they do take materials from other jurisdictions as well. So that was, a uh, our system in general. Um, so just to focus on what we have been doing with uh, the implementation part. Um, so as you notice, our system basically captures all organics and diverts it from the landfill. And then, you know, since SP383 uh, requires us to do that, and we are already there that way, uh, you know, our system is kind of set up to do that. We, I would say that yes, in our commercial system, we do have, because of our one plus bin system, we do have some work to do there. Um, and we are kind of focusing our energy there um, to figure that out. Then um, to meet the requirements, we have amended our municipal code and schedule of fines in December of 2021. Um, and then as, re as was required by the law. And um, so far, we have a robust educational and outreach program for both the systems. Like I mentioned, residential um, does their own and then a, a you know, commercial system, Republic Services is required to do that through their agreement, but then also we have staff on our city side as well doing outreach. And ESD's communication division works with us to provide outreach um, to residents various, um, using various crafts. Um, you may have seen the San Jose Recycles website that helps them to understand correctly how to recycle on the residential side. Um, and then, uh, of course, the regulation requires mixed waste uh, to be sent to a high diversion organics processing facility that, uh, you know, that recovers, as we all know, 50% of organics by January 2021, and then 75% by 2025. So we are, uh, all facilities are in the process of figuring that out. Um, you know, like uh, Calorie Cycle hopefully will issue us a list of which facilities actually qualify to be high diversion facilities, hopefully by next year. So we'll have a clearer picture there. Um, and then also uh, one of our residential agreements actually with Green Waste Recovery, um, the contract requires them to be a high diversion facility. So they will be uh, working towards that. We are working with our Republic on commercial side to see if that's the best approach that helps our system as well. So that's an option that uh, Republic is looking into as well as to become a high diversion facility. Um, then we also are working on our waiver process, um, uh, and we've kind of, you know, 
tested it out with a few businesses and we are just refining the process right now. We have developed forms and other things that the team is still finalizing so we can have a waiver process for our commercial system. For record keeping and uh, reporting, there's multiple systems currently in the city that provide reports that we need for all parts of the regulation, not just the collection and processing. So we will be you know, capturing data from there, but then we also want uh, some a system, a data management system that would be able to kind of fill in the gaps. So we're working towards that. So we should have some system ready to go, hopefully by the end of the uh, year, that will provide better record keeping and re reporting um, and make it easy on us when we do the report, hopefully next year. And uh, similar with procurement, you know, it's a work in progress, as all of us know, our target is just, as you would imagine, huge based on our population. So. Right now, our target is more than 83,000 tons. Um, and uh, the challenge we had there to figure out what is the current, uh, we were trying to figure out in the last year is what actually is the current usage within the city of basically focusing our energy on compost and mulch, but uh, not been successful yet. So we are working towards that to basically identify that first is what is the current usage and if and how we will be able to meet that target of 83,000 tons. If we were to use um, uh, you know, different methods, not just compost and mulch, but that's, that's something that we're planning towards as we speak. Um, let me talk about some education and outreach that we have done so far. So uh, we launched a pilot in late April 2021 to test the effectiveness of our recycling cart lid with information on items um, that should and should not be placed on the recycle cart. So lids basically had graphics on them and uh, text was in English, Spanish and Vietnamese. And the pilot was actually partially grant funded by CalRecycle CRV funds. And we included about 5,000 single family households on routes with moderate to high contamination levels and in areas where English, Spanish, and Vietnamese are the primary languages spoken. So this study um, gave us a good idea. We got uh, from this fall 2020, and we are kind of continuing the, to do the same study on the routes with pilot lids. And, uh, we saw a reduction about, of about 20% and uh, when we did this pilot. So hopefully we'll be able to continue doing something similar um, and uh, you know, install more of these cartilage, uh, of, of these uh, you know, uh, lid, lids and uh, uh, reduce contamination in our systems. We also have a SB 383 webpage uh, that focuses on just SB 1383. We have done a citywide postcard to inform residents um, of what the requirements are of SB 1383. And then we also do, you know, our recycle right uh, messages, like I said, in three languages. So we are able to get, we are hopefully able to get out more and more information to our residents as well as businesses. Um, procurement, like I said, it's a work in progress. Uh, being uh, having such a big target kind of makes it hard. But then again, uh, as uh, we all know and ex are experiencing, this is an unfunded mandate. So we really uh, are not in a position right now to invest any funding to just purchase something that we are not already using. So our focus right now is just on the materials that we are currently using, and uh, uh, figure out what that will look like um, from there. And uh, a big part of that is we are hoping to get a consultant on board to do that work for us to identify what the gaps are with the working with departments and uh, uh, see where the usage is coming from and uh, uh, potentially eventually making the requirement for the city departments as required by law to just use SP 1383 approved products. Um, so working on that right now. Similar thing with recycled content paper. We currently already have um, our EP3, our environmental friend preferred uh, uh, procurement policy, but it needs a little bit of tweaking to get to where SB 1383 wants us to be. So our, uh, we have been uh, working under that policy, which is required uh, by all contractors to fo be followed as other policies in the city. So uh, we are kind of working towards ed um, editing that to make sure that uh, SB 383 requirements are met. 
We actually currently have um, some compost that's produced through, uh, procured through our haulers. So Z-Best is required to provide us about 2000 tons of compost annually at no cost. But uh, under our current system, we haven't been able to utilize all of that. So that's part of the plan is at least to use all of that since it's free and then also add on more as we need to. Um, let me see. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, for record keeping and reporting as well, same thing, we are working on uh, with our haulers and other departments uh, to kind of get there uh, and have all the reports ready to go when we do first time report out in October. And then have some uh, better reporting, hopefully, by next uh, cycle when we start reporting in July of uh, 2023. And uh, like I said, we are updating our procurement policy. And then also right now there's an RFQ that we're working on for our data management system to fill in all the gaps that our current uh, systems don't provide within the city for all the reporting requirements. For edible food recovery, uh, we are participating in a, a countywide uh, work group to, uh, and working with them. So the Santa Clara County has um, uh, contracted with Joint Venture Silicon Valley to manage the food recovery program planning and implementation through June of 2023. So Joint Venture Silicon Valley has been working on making sure that all cities in Santa Clara County are in compliance with um, all the requirements for the food recovery piece. And uh, we are a big part of that, of course. Um, we do have a big stake in that, and you know the, this organ uh, the way we are, um, the county has been involving all stakeholders has been awesome. Like having Second Harvest there with us discussing these things has been very helpful. Second Harvest, lo loaves and fishes, they all have been a big part of developing that program. So it's work in progress, but we're getting close. Um, we'll hope we are. This is a snapshot of their website that they've put together which has all the information for all the generators, tier one and tier twos, to meet the requirements of the regulation as they need to. Funding wise, currently we haven't, uh, you know, we are basically utilizing all our current existing fundings. We haven't uh, figured out or worked on what additional funding can uh, meet our, help meet our requirements, but we do have some uh, either some parts of our positions or um, within our division uh, to justify for uh, implementation of this regulation. And uh, like I said, Joint Venture Silicon Valley is funded through um, RWRC, our county group, to develop this regional program. And they have been funded through July of June of 2023. We also took advantage of our SP, the SP 23 local assistance grant. So our, we were able to apply for about $1.35 million um, uh, to meet that. And uh, as I'm sure, as all of you guys, we are waiting to hear back and see what is being approved for, for that grant. So in the mix of what we could apply with that amount, um, it, was, it was a big shift certainly for us when we first, the grant came out, it was $20,000 and then it went up for us, it went up to $1.3 million. So it was a quick lift to get that grant um, submitted. Uh, but we kind of applied for a data management system, additional outreach, uh, a vehicle for one of our inspectors, uh, conducting some consultant work to meet our requirements and uh, mainly the in more labels for residential carts, like I mentioned earlier, we have been working on that pilot as well. So still looking for long-term funding sources. We um, haven't figured that out yet, but um, uh, potentially that would be helpful, right? Like that's the main thing that we have been struggling with is uh, we've been working with current staff and it has been a big lift for our team as well, uh, like I would imagine any other group um, to just get there. Some lessons learned, definitely coordination takes time. <laughs> Sometimes it feels like we are building the plane while flying it, um, but uh, it's, it's also important to note that our challenges and complexities are also due to being a larger city we have a lot more big departments to coordinate with, lots of layers of staff and management to work through. And sometimes it's difficult to figure out who the owner or, um, is or to get someone to take ownership of a particular piece of the regulation. So definitely will be, uh, it's helpful to, need, uh, to have champions and upper management to move the message forward. But our uh, my team has been 
diligently making sure through months and um, probably last couple of years now to make sure it's it's known to rest of the uh, departments that this regulation is citywide and it's not just a, a solid waste regulation that our division, our department needs to enforce. So we have spread the word and a lot of other departments now, of course, are in the loop and we are trying to make sure that we have good plans in place for all the departments to meet their requirements. Uh, the first step we took in that respect was we did a study session April of 2020 um, and that was our first step to get even our council on board that this regulation is coming and it's going to hit us, um, you know, big time. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, we'll need resources, but we really don't have funding for it right now. Thank you very much. That's a great, very great presentation, Shakia. Um, we're going to hold questions until uh, we go through the other two presentations. Um, so, but I see some questions beginning to form there in the chat box. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Tim Israel's up next with uh, Sacramento County, which is a blended urban and rural community, and uh, so he'll be talking to us. And at the moment, you're still uh, muted, Tim, so I'll let you get, get back, Mike, back off. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, I assume my screen's up and looking good. Looks good. Yes, it is. All right. Thank you. So I'm Tim Israel. I uh, work uh, for Sacramento County's Department of Waste Management and Recycling. And uh, here to tell you what we've been working on. Um, basically, uh, who is uh, the SAC Green Team? We're a department of over 300 employees who operate a, a vertically integrated waste system in an unincorporated uh, Sacramento County. So we have over 165 thousand um, uh, residents or, or customers, and we provide a, a three cart service to those folks. We also operate a transfer station and the key for landfill. Um, for on the commercial side, we oversee a, a um, group of 20 uh, basically um, franchise commercial haulers in a, a non-exclusive system. And for residential, collection, we plan to start weekly uh, organics collection in July of 2022. So here uh, coming up very, very soon. Um, so I'm going to run through just quickly uh, the, the various areas we've been touching on and um, talk about what we've been doing. Uh, on organics uh, uh, processing capacity, we got really uh, started really early once uh, 1383 came out and it was clear. Uh, that we we're going to need the, that processing capacity for, for organics, not just green waste. We uh, teamed up with the cities of Sacramento and Folsom and worked on uh, securing uh, long-term capacity for processing. And, and out of that process, uh, we, we've secured uh, five to 10 year agreements for, for organics processing with three different processors in, uh, in the Sacramento area. And we're actually even taking that a step further and even pursuing longer term, like five to 25 year type con contracts with processors to really secure that organics processing capacity for us as we move into the future. Um, in our commercial system, uh, our haulers are, are kind of on the hook for securing their, their capacity separately. And, and they've been able to do that uh, through uh, one of our local processors at Yolo County. Um, we anticipate that um, our, our county capacity report should show that there will be sufficient cap capacity uh, locally for, for the county, at least in this initial uh, capacity report we're putting out. Um, on the collection side, um, we collect our own residential. And as a result of uh, having to go to weekly organics collection, we're adding 18, 18 routes. We've also rerouted virtually our entire customer base. So over 80% of our uh, customers recently, just this last two weeks, have gone through a reroute that'll help improve our efficiencies on our collection system. Um, we're working real hard on our commercial side. We've spent a lot of time on our commercial side to get 
both organics and recycling compliance rates up for all of our commercial generators. Um, we've issued a lot of waivers on the commercial side and even a few on the residential side. And um, we had a pretty significant number of generators who did not have a green cart. So uh, up to 10,000 generators will be getting a new cart here in the next few months. Um, education outreach, we've been um, real busy with that. Um, we're gonna have a very specific 1383 and weekly organics rollout here in the next couple months with our, our customers. Uh, we're using a real wide variety of uh, media outlets, uh, you know, the traditional mailers, uh, calendars. Um, we have an app that we are really pushing. That's our, our big push is, is get the app because everything else is on there, connects you to a variety of services. Um, we also have multiple messages, not only going to weekly organics, but uh, if you're getting a cart and you didn't have one before you're getting messages, if you have extra carts that are costing you more now, we're letting people know about that too. So it's a real big lift on the outreach part right now in this transition. Um, we're, we've got route review staff who we've employed for a few years now, going out, looking in carts. We're still doing that, tagging those carts as education, um, trying to ramp up our public presence at events. That's something that's been kind of on hold for a couple of years. Now we're hoping to get back out there. And of course, we continue to work uh, very closely with our schools on, on several levels. Um, record keeping and reporting. Yeah, it's, that's all coming. Uh, we're gonna generally follow CalRecycle's guidelines. Uh, with, again, a variety of, of the data sources and getting those integrated is certainly a long-term or aspirational goal for us, so we'll see how we do. Uh, we submitted that initial compliance report. We did not submit a NOIC. Um, we're on track to uh, submit both those edible food recovery and organics processing capacity reports. And I think October 1st will be a challenge to compile all that data uh, since we're only given a couple months. So we can thank CalRecycle for that. Um, edible food recovery. Uh, we formed up a working group with our other jurisdictions in the county. We really, we all agree that we should be taking a regional approach to this, that the food recovery organizations really aren't organized on jurisdictional boundaries. We've hired a consultant, our uh, three consultants, and they're working with the food bank to, to put together these capacity reports and, and working on implementation concepts. Um, we're, it's early stages, early planning stages, but we are working uh, together to just figure out exactly how the program will be managed. And even internally at the county, we're still debating who's taking the lead and who's gonna be responsible for what. So, while uh, edible food recovery is moving forward, we're certainly in the early stages there. Um, funding for all this, um, you know, our residential side, we, we, we got a rate increase for residential. Uh, took us over three years and, and several iterations through COVID issues. And it had been a long time since we had uh, had an increase anyhow. So it was quite a lift for us, but we do have rates that will support our, our residential program now. Um, all of our commercial revenue, which a lot of it used to go to our general fund, it's coming into our own programs now. Um, we did increase our facility rates to cover big capital improvement costs, in particular, a new transfer building for organics uh, that we're gonna be in, uh, putting at our transfer station. And then uh, for edible food, we still do not have a source of funding for that. And we'll be trying to figure that out over the next couple of years. And finally, uh, go go get our app, and you can see what we're doing there. So um, that kind of concludes my uh, uh, presentation, and I'll relinquish control to Craig. Perfect, thanks, Tim. Um, yeah, Craig, are you ready to come up? And you're there. You go. You're yeah. Thank you. I'm good. Thank you. I'll uh, share my screen here. Let me do this first. Uh, share screen. So we're moving towards rural here as we go to Craig. Can you see that now? 
Yep, looks good. Uh, you're sharing uh, this. Uh, it's, that works. That's fine. Yeah, there we should be good now. <clears throat> um, so I'm Craig Sissel. I'm the deputy director over the waste and recycling division for Butte County. Uh, stationed here at the Neal Road Recycling and Waste Facility. It's our only uh, landfill um, for Butte County and actually one of the, the few in the regional area here. Um, let's see. Uh, we serve a population of 220,000 people in, the, in our county. Uh, we're five incorporated areas, Biggs, Chico, Gridley, Oroville, Paradise, and then we have the unincorporated area. Uh, we do both residential, commercial, and industrial municipal solid waste, and 95% uh, of our waste source comes from Butte County. On the map, you can see kind of what Butte County looks like and where it's centrally or kind of centrally located in Northern California. Uh, similar to Sacramento, we also, uh, for our capacity planning and reporting, we use R3 Consulting Group. They are both uh, working with our franchise haulers through the franchise hauler agreements. We have uh, three franchise haulers here in Butte County, Northern Recycling, uh, Recology, and Waste Management. And through the three of them, uh, they will be setting up their own uh, capacity planning uh, through the agreement. We're not really handling that internally. We're letting them kind of they know how much green waste they're taking in per week or month or whatever. So we're kind of forcing them to uh, determine how, where that material is gonna go and how much of it they're gonna have. We also, uh, I'll go to the next one. So we have a three cart system currently. Uh, we do bi-weekly recycling collection. We're gonna keep it that way. We found it might keep the cost down lower. The commercial haulers don't like it, or the franchise haulers don't like it too much because they lose out on some revenue if we had it weekly versus bi-weekly. But we found that most of the people in the community are fine with bi-weekly. It limits traffic flow of trucks through the neighborhoods. And most people don't generate a large volume of recycling to justify weekly collection at this time. Non-edible food waste. Uh, that most of that in our community goes to an anaerobic digester that we have here in this county, and uh, that's taken care of through the uh, franchise haulers. Our mixed organics are we're looking to transload those. Somebody has their mic on, please mute. Our mixed organics we're looking at because I'll back up a little bit. We did have a grant through Cal Recycle at one point to do a composting facility on our site. That was a $3 million grant. And we started doing the pricing on that more, more recently. And it started going up to about $8 million that we would, we'd have to come out $5 million out of our own pocket. We went down to Yolo County, saw what they were doing, their facilities closer to $21 million. So with knowing that information and being a small county with not a large cash stream, we backed out of it. And so now we have the mixed organics that need to go somewhere. Waste management doesn't have a local um, composting facility. Northern Recycling doesn't have one and Recology is the only one with theirs at Ostrom Road. So to help with that situation, we're looking at creating a transloading facility on site where that material would come to us, we'd put it in haul trucks and it'd be sent to the, the contractor who wins our bid at that point, it might be cheaper to haul it to YOLO. It might be cheaper to go to Napa. We don't know yet, but when we see the uh, bids come through, that's what'll determine where the material is gonna go and who the company that wins the transloading contract where, who will be doing that. Waivers, um, we applied for a low population density waiver, uh, less than 75 people per per square mile, 37,600 of our residents uh, fall into that area. On the little map, you can see the white areas are that area. So it's a big volume. So out of the 220,000 people that live here, the majority of them live in the gray boxes and the 37,600 live in the white areas. So it does help. Um, prevent those people from having to comply with SB 1383 for five years, which I'm sure at that point, we'll probably have to readdress that and incorporate them into it. 
but at this time it's just the gray areas that will be faced with the mandatory collection. We also applied for AB 619, the notice of intent to comply. We basically checked every box on there except the Cal Green and the one that dealt, deals with water conservation. Every other box we checked uh, and we have those requirements delayed until January of 2023, which we're hoping we will comply with by that time. Although we do know that some of them are gonna be more difficult due to the supply chain with carts and trucks as well as finding drivers in this area, being that we're a small community, it's hard to find drivers that want to do these routes at this time. Monitoring waste audits and inspections. Uh, we put that again into the franchise hauler agreements where the franchise haulers, which are doing most of this already with their onboard cameras uh, and lid flips, they Actually, one of, our one of my employees here uh, has a story where he put a bicycle rim into the, one of the cans and he got a nasty gram sticker on his can because the bicycle rim was not supposed to go in that can. So they're actively using those cameras to notify people, even though the ordinance has not been passed by our uh, board of directors yet. That's scheduled to go ahead in April 12th for the first reading. Our landfill, um, we'll be doing, as part of the waste audit, we'll be doing the 200 pound samples. The problem that we're unsure of right now is, is that 200 pounds for a 200 pound sample for the whole day? Or is there a criteria that says if you do 300 vehicles in a day, you're supposed to do 200 pounds of the each 100 vehicles or every 25 vehicles? Cal Recycle hasn't really specified that yet. So we're looking at as, out of the 300 vehicle vehicles, we're gonna pull a 200 pound sample. So that'd be about a half a pound or three quarters of a pound per vehicle. <laughs> They're probably not gonna be happy with that, but it's not set up to specify yet how, what the interval of those 200 pound samples are per the, per the waste stream. Uh, landfill code enforcement will also be doing a big portion of this. If the waste haulers put out too many, if they have to, uh, put out a notification to, to a house four or five times, maybe even three times. We haven't put the set the criteria for that yet, but if it hits a certain maximum threshold, our code enforcement will go out to enforce that with that particular individual. We're hoping that these little stickers that go on the can that say, don't put your bicycle tire or rim in this particular can is enough to notify most people or the, the $50 fines that they'll be facing per, per uh, infraction will stop them enough before our code enforcement has to go out there, but that's how we're going to handle that at this current time. Education and outreach. Our environmental health will be doing the education and outreach of the edible food recovery, and our landfill will be, uh, again, going through a lot of the franchise hauler agreements to put out the flyers in their billings to let the customers know what goes in the can. Procurement, our general service has kind of taken the reins on that for now, even though it's multi-departmental, it's going to be a little problematic that way in that um, they can't really, they can give us advice on what we do. It's up to us to Im implement it, but they will be kind of facilitating that from their uh, contacting places like, uh, drawing blank right now on uh, the supply chain, but they'll be reaching out to those supply chains and saying, if somebody calls you from Butte County, we want them to only buy certain services from you that have a certain um, paper, recycled paper content to include recycled uh, toilet paper content, something like that. And uh, budget constraints, the thing we're finding is a problem and I don't, I'm not really certain how other jurisdictions have met this yet, but contracting. A lot of these things in, through government contracting, there's contracting code for a lot of these things. We can't just choose a company to do a certain service for us. We have to go out through RFP, RFQ, all that thing to get contracts in place. So that's going to hold up a lot of this process as well that we're facing. So we're open to finding out from other uh, jurisdictions how they're actually bypassing contracting code to get different departments or different uh, companies set up through that. Record keeping and reporting again, multi-agency. We get some, a lot of the information comes from our franchise haulers already. 
and uh, we'll be reaching out to them to gather that information and then we'll be the reporting agency to CalRecycle. Edible food recovery, uh, environmental health has kind of taken on the role of that at this time. Um, we have a company called North County Food Bank uh, here in the county that's kind of uh, spearheaded that. They're using a software called Food Rescue Hero, which sounds to be really good. It provides a great opportunity. It's software that everybody has access to. So not just the restaurants have the ability to call in and say, we have five loaves of bread or uh, five gallons of soup or whatever. If you have a cherry or apple tree or something at your house and it's bearing fruit and you have a surplus, you could also get on this software and notify them that uh, you've got a few boxes that you've pulled of apples or cherries or whatever the, the produce is for them to come pick it up and redistribute it out into the uh, local community that needs it. So again, the funding, uh, this is, seems to be the big elephant in the room for all of us. Um, CalRecycle, we, we applied for a grant, uh, not a $1.3 million grant, but uh, we did receive a little bit of money from them. The problem is with our ordinance not being approved as of yet by our Board of Supervisors, it delays our um, acceptance of that um, grant and ours is being delayed now until September 2022 which we will be using mainly for education outreach and our transloading facilities. So we've actually put off a lot of our education and outreach um, at this time because we don't have the funding for it. Also that goes along with procurement as well um, without most of the county works off of a general fund, which is tax-based and um, they have set budgets for all the departments. And now this big, uh, lift per se of procuring this material that wasn't originally part of their budget is a is a big um, hole in that right now uh, our budget is due july 1st as most of people on this call probably are and that was a, a kind of a problem trying to get that into this coming fiscal year not knowing exactly what this is going to cost I like uh, San Jose's idea where they're getting their compost back for free. Um, we're gonna have to try to see if we can't incorporate that into our franchise agreements for the, uh, the person that is transloading it and um, maybe rehauling that back through a free service. Great idea. And that's it for, my, uh, for mine at this time. Really appreciate that. That was a very uh, interesting set of presentations. And uh, uh, we're now going to open into um, kind of an open dialogue, which is going to be new for us. Uh, we, we avoided that last year, uh, but this year we really want to have more of a discussion. Um, and so um, it, I'd like to, I, I see there's a few questions in the chat box and it looks like a few of them already been answered by chat. Um, but I'm looking down here and seeing, uh, for example, at um, Tim, there's a question to you about the breakdown of your route reviews and um, things that follow around that, or says auditing. You have a chance? Can you can you take a look at that one? And, and by the way, we don't need to stay to the to the to the um, chat box, but I like to kind of run through them since people did put them in there first, and uh, go from there. Well, I'll, I can respond on the route review stuff. Uh, sure. We have a team that goes out uh, and essentially they, they have a several tasks when they go out. Not only are they looking in the carts, but they're also applying tags to the carts. So we're trying to mm. get RFID tags on all of our carts. So we're doing that at the same time. And then they look in for, it's a visual inspection. It's not a, a quantification of uh, contamination. It's basically, do you have you know, film plastics, you have tanglers, uh, you know, there's a list of uh, contaminants and then we'll tag those carts or give them a great job tag and move on to the next resident. And so um, we're challenged right now with uh, just staffing in general and our, our collection operation is under a lot of pressure as far as uh, just getting enough drivers to get out and do the job, particularly once we go to weekly organics. So, Right now, we're, we're doing a combination of the route reviewers and using our drivers' observations and tagging efforts also for the route review program. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Um, 
it looks like some of their questions are, you know, about receiving the presentation and so on. Um, Craig, there's a question there for you about fining or not. Um, if you're if you're announcing a warning system or before you finding it, I think you kind of addressed that. But go ahead and yeah. So, so in our in our current uh, franchise agreements, they have the ability to notify people, and I think it's after the second or third time of notification, they have the ability to find them. And mm -hmm. so uh, most of the time, people are uh, are complying. Uh, I haven't heard too many issues with people not complying. But if they do not comply, they do have the ability to uh, to levy a fine towards those the people not meeting those. Okay. That's what's in our chat box. Um, are there other questions people want to raise on the phone? And if you do, just unmute yourself and or raise your hand. Actually, I can't see the whole profile of everyone. It's here today, but why don't you unmute yourself and <clears throat> we'll try to be uh, try to find a way through this uh, open conversation phase. Uh, without too much chaos. Well, while people are formulating their questions, okay. I'll just say on the county side, our approach is a little bit different on enforcement on carts. What we did is in our code, um, we our code now allows our director to add service to customers who are habitual contaminators of carts. So if uh, they, uh, while we, we really haven't developed this program yet, we have the ability to, so uh, once uh, a, a, a generator has been notified multiple times to add additional refuse service to their bill and service so that they don't contaminate the carts anymore. And so that's, that's the approach the county has taken on 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 that that issue thanks tim um a question came in here and it's it's aimed a bit uh, uh i could change it just a bit the question is um about uh, accepting food sold paper and it talks about the anaerobic digestion facility that's having trouble with carbon but i can imagine the same with composting facilities so this is kind of an open question to uh, all three of you i think um what what's your appetite or how have you dealt with uh, food sold paper and the downstream recipients of that material. Tim, speaking for San Jose, we haven't heard anything from our uh, provider uh, of that being mm -hmm. an issue. They do sort out certain things even before it goes into the digester. So um, we kind of leave it up to them to decide what they want to do with that material. It is their expertise, uh, but I don't think we, uh, we haven't heard any complaints yet from uh, ZUED or other residential haulers. Uh, I can't speak for all the residential processing facilities. Um, I don't oversee that program, but um, mm -hmm. uh, nothing big has come up yet as I, as I know of it. Tim, has that been a problem for Sac County and your three contractors? Well, it hasn't, that has not come up. We have, you know, our residential program really hasn't started with food soil paper. So that, that really hasn't come to, to be yet. But all our contracts do include food soil paper as an acceptable material in the program. Um, where we we do we have been hearing from folks is on compostable bags, plastic bags, and concerns about that from our processors. And so our our approach, you know, while while still they can be accepted, we are not emphasizing the use of those bags. And so we're we're kind of walking this thin line that. Um, you know, I think over time here, we're going to find out uh, more about the acceptability of those materials and whether or not they should be in our programs or not. For now, we're kind of tiptoeing, trying, trying to stay on between, between the issues, so to speak. Interesting. Craig? Yeah, we're not far enough along yet. We're still even trying okay. to get our ordinance passed, so we're not even to the level yet of combining the two uh, structures together to even worry about soiled paper at this point. I know if you had a clean green program, it will change your OMRI certification or, but anyway, um, that's another topic, I guess. Um, here's a question here from Amber about how much cooperation your uh, solid waste division has had on uh, from other city county departments. Um, apparently this is a problem there. Um, have you convinced them to participate I can imagine that could be an issue, but um, any 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 challenges from any of the three of you on that topic? 
Well, I, I'll say that we've, you know, we've worked with our other departments. Our, our purchasing department was actually uh, very cooperative. Um, we worked with them on revising our uh, environmental purchasing policy to in integrate 1383 requirements. Um, we'll, we'll see how the actual implementation goes, but they've been, uh, you know, with the other departments having to, to uh, uh, kick in uh, their data, their information, um, just the physical uh, uh, getting all of our commercial accounts with the county up to speed with, you know, uh, organic service and recycling service has been a little bit of a challenge just because the departments are, you know, don't want to spend the extra money just like everybody else. Um, edible food, uh, we're, we're still working through it. It's uh, a program that I, I think everybody recognizes the importance of, but there's not a lot of people jumping up in front and saying, I'm taking the lead on this. Uh, so we're, we're still working through that and I think we'll get there. So, um, you know, it, it, we're dragging them along, kicking and screaming, basically. Well, and it kind of it speaks to the topic of, of uh, outreach, even to I mean to elected officials, not to the public necessarily, but to education outreach. I know Sac County, you guys had a quite a bit of a, a effort to get that rate increased, and I'm not convinced you really actually covered the future rates. You <laughs> so there's a and you've had a lot of a lot of pushback on that. So um, um, I, I only talk about rates as a, as an elected official and the um, the the pushback of, of someone not wanting to participate because uh, the hassle factor at all. But um, I see a question here about drivers as a problem. Um, and I think for some of you, you contract with services outside. So, uh, but any, anyone who wants to talk about actually just a labor shortage altogether, any, any thoughts on that? Well, I, I can say for us, it's a huge problem. I mean, we, you know, we need to add over 20 positions to cover those organic routes. And uh, we're having a hell of a time filling those positions. Even right now, we're getting just to that point where we, even if we got somebody in the queue, we may not have them up and trained by the time July 1st hits uh, for our rollout. So yeah, it's, it's a big problem for any jurisdiction because we're just not nimble on adjusting mm -hmm. what we can pay operators. Uh, bonuses are out there in the private sector that we can't match. Um, you know, that old uh, guarantee of a stable job and a pension just doesn't go where it used to uh, with, with potential employees. So we're, that's, that is our single biggest problem right now in fully implementing 1383 for, for our county, I think, is, is literally being able to attract those operators in so we can fully implement our residential program. Shakia, so. I can imagine that's a real problem in San Jose for the privates. Um, I'm thinking uh, the cost of living and all in, in, in your city. Um, um, I know there's pressures on the union side of things for some of the other cities that are dealing with this. Um, what, what Have you heard back from any of your um, your contracted services on that? Um, not lately. Staffing on other fronts has been uh, challenging. Like we have recycling coordinators that work with uh, public services that has been under revolving door. But on the driver side, um, they are Teamsters on Republic and um, ha haven't heard them complain yet. But that's with that agreement, we really don't get in the mix on that either. So they have to take care of that regardless on how they manage that. So but yes, I haven't heard much yet. Yeah, I, I, in particular, I'm, I'm thinking about um, the need for exploring automation and, um, you know, ways to make, because some of these environments are very harsh for him, people right. to be in. And um, I'm imagining that's going to be a problem down the yeah. road. So um, no, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all and right. We're, uh, face, we're facing little... that here in our, in our region as well. We had a, we were on a call the other day with one of our waste hauler uh, managers, regional managers, and he was out actually driving one of the trucks. They're that short staffed. And then we also face issues, uh, as you mentioned earlier, with, with finances, with rate increases. Uh, one of our board members actually prides himself that we are the cheapest rates from uh, Stockton or San Joaquin County up to the Oregon border. So that doesn't really help us with uh, 
wages for employees and things like that. And then uh, we're doing a class comp study right now for our county. And we actually are, are hated by the local counties because we help bring their rates down. It's <laughs> kind of amazing giving what, what's happened in your county, uh, Craig, I, you know, with Paradise and all the, the history of what's happened. I, I am shocked that you have a low rate like that, actually. It's amazing. Um, Tim, looks like there might be a button pressed by Constance. I don't know if um, Constance has a question. Oh, I, I didn't see that, Constance. Yeah, can you unmute yourself? Oh, I, was, I was just wondering about the requirement to uh, go to a procurement via RFP. Um, if that was a local ordinance or requirement and or why not rely on the state general authorization to do sole source negotiated? Interesting question. Um, has anybody attested that? Um, I think that's for facilities, Constance. I'm not sure about services, but uh, maybe you want to advise us since okay. you're in Okay, so they're building a facility. Okay, <laughs> facilities, yes. Got it. I, I just don't know. I'm not a con you know, you're you're the expert in this topic. So, but I, I know um the yeah, facilities are much tougher, I understand. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Any of our any of our panelists have any insight on that? Or does anybody else on the call have insight on that? You don't have to be just a panelist. You want to unmute yourself. Uh, Constance has got a good question. I can just say from my department's perspective, we prefer to have competitive procurements. So in general, most of our procurements are not sole source, they're not negotiated. We do go through some sort of competition. And you started that in 2019 or 2020? I mean, it was a long time ago, Tim, what Dave put For the, the Yeah, our organics per, procurement yeah. went a long time. It, it took much longer, uh, mm -hmm. primarily due to issues associated with delays in our rate increase and, and COVID had a certainly had a hand in that so our rate increase was originally uh the first meeting was in march of 2020 and so it was immediately delayed <laughs> six months and then it took still yet another six months or so to get anything going to where we could then say we have the funding to uh commit to these organics contracts and so um it was a long process and thankfully our processors we're patient with us, but uh, you know it sets us up well for the future, as far as flexibility and be able to manage our, our waste streams. Speaking of that uh, process, Dave uh, Ghirardelli has a question here about how does San Jose or Butte County, or any of the other jurisdictions on the call. Uh, Are you still there, Tim? Being recorded. Oops. You still there, Tim? Yeah, I'm still here. Did we lose everyone? No, just you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you were amazing. asking the question from Dave about the um, organics capacity plans. And I think that's primarily Correct. county function, right? Uh, so I well, don't know, you, others? Yeah, Dave, you I, mean, I think that's first? correct. Like we haven't delved into that just because I think that was a county function, yeah. Yeah, so I can talk on that. So, so we're using R3 consultants and they're going through franchise haulers agreements to uh, come up with that. And so it's really up to our franchise haulers to secure that capacity. And then um, the, uh, count, the cities and towns are uh, securing edible food or not the, yeah the edible food procurement side of things and then we also have a anaerobic digester on in our county that a lot of them are using for the non-edible food side of organics the mix collection is going to have to actually go to a compost facility which we don't have and it's probably going to be ostrom road is the closest one uh, it's about i think 75 to 100 miles away so i mean even though it sounds great to do composting I don't know that uh, wear and tear on the roads, use of fossil fuels, all that stuff, if it is the best thing to be transloading stuff 100 miles away to have to haul it back to be used in the community. It's, it's interesting. Fair. Um, what about uh, multifamily dwellings? How, how is it, how's the rollout going on some of these uh, more challenging generators? Anybody wanna talk about that? 
I know San Jose's got your your uh, commercial program probably addresses that. Um, no, actually, Tim, uh, our commercial is very different from our uh, multifamily. Okay. So the multifamily actually works uh, the same as our uh, residential program. But luckily, since we have back-end processing and the yard trimmings uh, separately collected, uh, we have not had challenges with MFDs, uh, the way that the process works uh, with our system, with the three bins that they have, three bins slash, you know, uh, uh, collecting yard uh, trimmings on uh, without a bin uh, lose in the street. So, so yeah, so our program actually is working very well uh, with the way it is right now. And we haven't had any waiver issues either yet. So we're not planning to issue any waivers to MFDs as of now. Okay. Uh, Tim, what are you doing in Sac County? Well, we're working with our commercial haulers to get those multifamily uh, residents signed up. So it's mm -hmm. really almost a, a, an apartment complex by apartment complex effort for us. Mm -hmm. um, we're supporting those programs through distribution of some kitchen pails uh, with, you know, our messaging on it. And so we're, we're working at it. I mean, we're, we're chipping away. I, I don't, I'm not privy to our most recent numbers, but we are, we are uh, pressuring our, our haulers to, to roll out services to all of those generators. And, and we'll take on those, you know, multifamilies, you know, we, we, we've been working at it, um, but we'll really start really working at it after July 1st, so. And that sounds pretty much, yeah, yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, pretty much what you're going to be doing too, Craig, right? You're kind of, it's in, in its infancy. Yeah, and then we also see it as kind of being a problem because a lot of these places have, uh, I mean, we all face homelessness and they go out and they get in these bins and they tear them apart and the trash ends up everywhere. And so they've all been gated and locked lately and so to fit a new bin waste receptacle for mixed organics in that same area is going to be problematic because it's probably going to take up one or two parking spots in the in the parking lots and all that stuff as well so um thanks nice, nice conversation um again anybody um in the that's attending wants to unmute your mic and ask a question uh kind of like constance did or if you want to put more into the chat box i'm not seeing any more here but um want to uh, be open to that part of our goal here was to have really an interactive discussion on um how you know you may want to be or you're doing something different you're experiencing something unique in your community um and uh we were trying to trying this new platform so we're open to uh, anyone that wants to to do that. And I can't see if there's any hands being raised. Ruth, can you see that? No hands raised yet, but I think, you know, just anybody that would like to uh, share, um, yeah. you know, uh, we could, it looks like David Davis has his hands raised. Go ahead and unmute. Oh. Hey, Dave. Hi, Tim. Hey, I just, uh, I wanted to address something that Craig said about having the lowest rates in the area. And that kind of struck a nerve with me and I think part of the public education, a lot of times we think about public education, uh, we need to educate our elected officials. And, you know, we only work for uh, uh, local jurisdictions. So we're always sitting on the other side of the table from uh, trash haulers. And we want to do the best deal that we can. But I also tell elected officials that uh, you don't want to have the lowest rates in the valley. You don't want to have the lowest rates in the region. Um, you know, a lot of uh, elected officials feel that way, and sometimes they wrongfully take pride in having these really low rates. Um, but the last thing you want is to have somebody who's providing a vital public service not making money or even making a little bit of money because they're not going to be that earnest about providing you with good service. So it just kind of struck a nerve with me, Craig, when you said that, and I kind of feel sorry for you in a little way. Um, but I think all of us need to kind of remind our elected officials that this is not what we want. We don't want the lowest rates in the region. You want to have competitive rates that are reasonable and probably where you'd like to be is kind of right in the, in the middle of the pack because, boy, I'll tell you, sometimes um, these companies, they negotiate poor agreements and they get stuck with it and the cities you know, want to hold their feet to the fire because they're this big company and they've got tons of money. Um, but it really translates over, over time 
into um, a bad situation. So anyway, Craig, you just kind of struck a nerve with me when you said that, and I wanted to put in my two cents that um, we really need to do public education to our elected officials. And all of this, all of this costs so much money. It's very expensive. And in municipalities are raising rates up and down the state. Um, but the last thing you want is somebody who's providing a vital public service uh, not making a reasonable return. So anyway, not a question, just uh, struck a nerve and I thought I would chip in. So there you go. Interesting yeah, thanks, point. David. Dave, uh, you can come up and talk to our elected officials. We I would be happy to. <laughs> I'll bring my soapbox with me. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, I, I totally get it, Craig. And I know I know what had to happen again in, in Sacramento County. Watch that process. It was painful. Um, a lot of elected officials get there uh, on the on the presumption or on the claim that uh, they won't raise taxes or raise costs, and particularly uh, where there are um, large populations of people that that are are um, on fixed incomes. So, um, not an easy task, and especially in this environment. So, but good point, Dave. Appreciate it. Anybody else want to reply, Tim, Shakia? Okay. Oh, I, um, I, I, I'll, I'll just, go ahead, Tim. Sorry. Well, I'll just say at our facilities, we had a significant rate increase and it was, I mean, cost of service and uh, there was a lot of hit, pushback, but certainly not as much on our residential increases at, at, as at our facilities. So uh, the, the politicians really were focused on their, their you know, residents and, and what they're paying. We got a few hands raised there, Tim, from uh, Jasmine. Yeah, I see, and then Mike. I see Jasmine has a question. You want to unmute yourself, Jasmine? And then there's a, also some things in the in the chat box. Go ahead. Hi, um, I'm from city of Glendale in SoCal. And um, I was wondering if anyone had any more input on their current route reviews or if you are trying to implement a program, I've been reaching out to a couple of places, Recology and We Zero being one of them, to get more information about what's their process for route reviews. Because I know SB 1383 doesn't go into a regulated amount of accounts per route you have to audit. So they kind of leave that up to us. And we're trying to formulate the best formula to uh, figure out how many is enough or a good amount per route, because they do need to get every route, which is we have about 123 or so, and each route needs to get audited annually. So I was just trying to get some feedback from any other jurisdictions here that may have already implemented a program for the route reviews. Somewhat addressed it a bit ago, but I, maybe we missed it. Um, I know Craig, you already said some stuff about routing and Tim as well. What, what are your thoughts? Um, well, I'll, I'll say for us, I mean, it's really a matter of, of how much staff we have available to get out there and do it. Uh, as you said, Cal Recycle hasn't provided us guidance on uh, the frequency or, you know, what, what quantity other than it, each route needs to be annual. Uh, so for us, um, you know, we would like to hit every, you know, basically have a day per route and go out and, and spend a day out there. Um, that, that's our goal. Uh, will we make that? We may not. I mean, um, as the as the program though does mature, I would expect that we will have staff available to, to go out and, and do just that, which is one day per route. That would be probably for us between 25 and 50 residents that would get the, the review. Anyone want to add on to that or an experience outside the group? Um, I, Mike, if you'll hang on a second, I see two or three questions that are all kind of similar. Lisa and Sadie are both asking a kind of a question about uh, what do you do with those folks that are outside the box, like backhaul, self haul, verifications, um, how's record keeping track, the landscapers. That, to me, they're kind of all in a somewhat similar kind of a situation. Um, are you have we have we evolved to a point where we can handle those things yet, or is that something we're still figuring out? We are still figuring out Tim, um, some of this stuff. Like I, I put that in the chat that we actually did some outreach. We created, a, a, we used, you know, a, a couple of cities in Santa Clara County have used some outreach material that we have reached out to the landscapers 
uh, within the county and within our city just to inform them of the regulation that they are required to track the materials. Um, but we haven't gone further on that yet. Uh, my enforcement team has been trying to figure out how to address the backhaul cell fall issue on the generator side from uh, food generators and such. Um, so it's still work in progress. And of course, it's gonna take some time to settle down. So we've started to reach out, but not enough to report out yet. Okay. Um... And we use a, our, our scale house has waste works and we, we can use that with a code to track uh, landscapers as they come in to know how many self halls are coming in per month or per week or day or whatever. So we can break that down pretty easy um, to educate them. It's just gonna be coming through the gate and saying, hey, you know, you've got this with paper and plastic or something in there that's going to have to be sorted out into a different bag and you're going to have to keep the organic separate and that's where we're hoping to have the transloading facility on site so we can actually take that material put it over with that source and then get that all off site within 24 hours to a composting facility i'll right. um add just on self-haul waivers um you know we we're handling those basically uh, for our commercial customers primarily on a just a case by case basis really so the the generator will submit an application state that they self all we'll review that typically take them for their word depending on of course the size of the generator and if it seems reasonable or not and then our our plan really is to follow up with all these folks that are getting waivers in that 5 year period and uh, follow up and get out there and take a look at what they're doing. And so there's a lot of waivers that have been issued and, and our plans are to follow up with those folks and determine whether or not you know, the information they provided us is accurate and they still need a waiver in the future. So that's kind of our approach. Thanks. Um, Mr. Mahajer, I see you've got a question. Just to note, we're, we're down to the last nine minutes. So <laughs> what's on your mind? All right, Tim, my question is uh, basically goes uh, toward Dave Davis, what he said, and constant warning from the standpoint that uh, when you go with the increasing rates or fees or charges, whatever it is, we also have to comply with Prop 219 requirement. And I just want to hear from Constant if, if she is still online to answer the question of what to do having this uh, elephant in the room, which is a, I call it Prop 218. Oh, Mike, you're always so hard on me. <laughs> well, for a long time, um, local jurisdictions have been trying to break the link between the property and the payment of the fee to make it truly a service fee. And one way they do that is to develop self-haul options with um, a, an ordinance that prescribes uh, receipts and other evidence that the uh, homeowner or commercial uh, property is actually taking their waste to the dump or their recycling to the recycling facilities. Now for cities, I think that works pretty well because few people will do that. Um, you can charge a license fee for it just you know, for your processing costs, but I think um, you guys can all speak up, but in general, city folks aren't gonna opt for that. Yeah, you don't look convinced, Mike. <laughs> Yeah, and Mike, as far as Prop 218 goes, it has to do with public outreach. I think I heard uh, one jurisdiction that it took them three years of, uh, of outreach to uh, get their rates approved. And I think that's kind of incumbent on, on the hall or in city staff to educate people about um, the level of effort and the uh, resources that are required you know, to process this. You know? and, and one of the things that we see that's really driving costs is uh, putting food scraps in the green waste container uh, because there's not all these, you know, a lot of these facilities can't accept that particular mix and they require uh, certain permitting to do that. And it just create it, 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 it changes the recipe in such a way that it makes it a lot more expensive and a lot more scarce. And you know, that's kind of a, a fine point that people don't really appreciate. And it needs to be communicated uh, far in advance of when you go for the, uh, 
the Prop 218 hearing. So I think uh, it, it's it's just a fact of life in California, and it's a good thing. It protects the ratepayers. Uh, it is got there's a certain amount of administrative burden that's required and lead time. You got to do the 45 day notice. Um, uh, but, but it's just a fact of life. But I think if you plan in advance and you do the public outreach in advance and explain to the people uh, the resources that are required uh, and the cost of those resources, uh, I think that'll, that'll smooth it out. So I think, I think you just need to pre, uh, again, it goes to public outreach is not just the public, it's also the elected officials. Well, thanks. Um, thanks for that answer, Dave. Um, I think I at this point, we're going to being under Prop 218 is not so much just the administrative costs, but that you can't subsidize programs. And so you have all these education and other programs. Um, Mike, you remember L.A. County, they couldn't they couldn't advertise at the, at the state at the baseball park about the recycling because it was couldn't come from the the, the fee. So, well, I, I another I reason. Did. I did it for 30 years and it was a pain in the butt. <laughs> well, I see you've got a nice Hawaiian shirt on, Micah. So I, you can breathe deep and uh, here, here we go on to the next generation. Right. Effort. Um, so at this point, I'd like to thank everyone um, for participating. We want to wrap this up at the top of the hour pretty promptly because everyone's uh, got, got to get back to their other things. Um, I'd like to thank all the presenters for all their time and effort that went into this and uh, and opening uh, to uh, uh, being willing to open to a conversation like this. Um, thanks for the program committee for putting things uh, together and, and helping facilitate this. If you have an interest on these kind of topics and you have something that you would like to see happen, send um, send an email to the programs committee. Uh, that's Ruth Abbey, um, Kimberly um, uh, Cook of Agriman. Um, um, let's see, uh, Rachel Davis of Sac County and myself, Tim Ribley, HDR. So uh, send us any note you'd like and we'll see if we can put together the next program that fits your needs. Um, uh, remember the CRC event that's coming up or CRA rather event that's coming up in, uh, in May. Uh, Ruth had it at the very beginning. There's a, there's a note there for a link uh, to that event that we're co-sponsoring on that. And I think, um, as I said that too quickly at the end, um, if there are any other parting thoughts on this as we go forward, um, anyone else want to add to it? No, there. Thanks, Ruth. Ruth just reposted the uh, the link to the event that's coming up um, in May on the, the cost of food waste collection and recovery. Um, and I think I think that's about it. Uh, thanks everyone for participating, and uh, this will be posted on the Goldrush Chapter website as well as. The presentations will be posted there. And as a reminder, the entire 13 month events we did last year are all there as well. So uh, a lot of information is posted out there. Um, and so take a look at those sites for your uh, for your future. Looks like there's another message coming in here. Oh, thanks everybody, yeah. All right, uh, that, I wish everyone a great day and um, thanks for uh, participating. Uh, let us know of your thoughts, how we can improve this for your, uh, we're here to really serve the membership. So let us know what that is and we'll do our best to pull it together for you.